Well, good morning. Good to see you folks with us on this Sunday morning. Glad you were here. I'm going to encourage you to stand together with us. Hymn number 111, the tune you know as Rejoice, the Lord is King. The words are probably a little bit different to you. We come, O Christ, to you. I trust that as we sing the words, though you know the tune, that the words will be effective and helpful and encouraging your hearts this morning toward the truths we'll be looking at in God's word. We come, O Christ, to you. response of reading this morning from Psalm 68, verses 1 through 20. The words are in your bulletin this morning, your worship folder. They're on the screen as well. After the response of reading, we will remain standing. Brian Nance is going to lead us in our response of reading today. Psalm 68, 1 through 20. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those that hate him shall flee before him. But the righteous shall be glad, they shall exult before God, and they shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him, who arise to the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness. The earth awaked, the heavens poured out rain, the Lord God, the one of Sinai, the Lord God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O oh God, you shed abroad, you restored your inheritance as it languished. Your
The Lord gives the word. The women who announce the news are a great host. Though you men lie among the sheepfolds, the wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions with shimmering gold. When the Almighty scatters the kings there, let snow fall on the O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts among them, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs deliverances from death. As we continue to call one another to worship this morning, let's sing together, The Lord is my salvation.
Amen? Amen? It's okay to smile after that one. Okay. All right. We read from Psalm 68. Psalm 68. And the verse that's on the screen right now is going to jog the Apostle Paul's thinking. Because this verse here refers to God being the victorious king over Israel's foes, ascending to his throne, has captives. And Paul's going to think of that in our passage in Ephesians this morning and say, wait a minute, Jesus Christ ascended. Wait a minute, Jesus Christ was victorious. Wait a minute, Jesus Christ has captives. He's conquered sin and Satan and death. And so his mind goes to Psalm 68 and he quotes this verse. And so the very foundation this morning we look at, we get to serve a victorious Savior. He reigns today. Some of you need to hear that. You, you walk in fairly defeated right now. Our Savior is victorious. But even a better little twist upon the verse, Psalm 68 then says, the king gets to the throne and then, and then all the men, even the rebellious ones, have to give him gifts. And it has this picture of this victorious king. And then that culture that had been very common for them now to receive gifts. Yet when he points us to the verse in Ephesians, he says, actually, here's the beauty of it. Jesus Christ is our victorious, conquering king. And then he gives us gifts. We get them. He actually graciously gives us blessing out of his victory. What, what an amazing concept. That we actually get the blessings from Jesus Christ's victory. I know every Sunday when you guys come in and we gather, there are different weeks that happened. There are weeks where some of you guys come in and you're just naturally smiling because it's just been a good week for you. And then I know there are some that come in and they're hurting. There are some that come in and they're despairing. There are some that are here physically present, but they're disillusioned about really who even God is. And this is why I think there's value today to call us back to the fact that we have a Savior. No matter what your week was this week, He is the victorious reigning Savior who pours out His gracious gifts upon us. We're going to pray in a second. One of the individuals we're going to pray for is Ken and Jeanne Croker. When we think of God's blessings and his victory, I think wrongly we don't picture what Ken's going through right now. Um, this morning I received word from Jan in a text that he, Ken was just placed in hospice care. Um, I sat with them yesterday morning. It is a blessing to get to sit in those experiences and see what a victorious Jesus Christ means when we face the end of life. And that is victorious. And that is blessing. And so this morning we'll pray for Ken and we'll pray for Jan um, and what the day has for them today. And then, because I've made this as a prayer request, some of you guys are going to do this automatically, but I'm going to urge it to happen as well. Some of you need to write some notes this week. Um, send a text, but understand that Jan's probably going to get inundated with text and don't expect the text to be returned right away, but she still can be encouraged by hearing from you in text. This, for the Christian, is a wonderful, amazing privilege to get to go home. In conversation yesterday with Ken, it was, it was my joy to be able to say this simple thing, but isn't this so thankful that this isn't the end? We're not done. Because Jesus Christ is victorious over sin, over the penalty of sin, death, and over Satan. We have home with our Savior for all of eternity. And that we can praise our God for. So would you pray with me? Father God, I marvel 
that Jesus' defeat has been declared over and over again. Religious leaders around a cross declared his defeat. Roman guards and soldiers mocked him, seemingly a defeated king. There have been emperors and governors all throughout history that have believed that they have defeated Jesus Christ. Intellectuals have hoped to explain away Jesus. Individuals angry and wanting nothing to do with Jesus have attempted to push him aside. And I thank you this morning that that in spite of all that, or maybe even because of some of that around the cross, Jesus Christ still remains the conquering, never defeated, victorious King. He's defeated sin, Father, and I say thank you for that, because we could not. He's defeated the, the payment for the penalty of sin, death, and we thank you for that, so we don't have to pay it. And he has defeated Satan. And we thank you for that. It gives us hope today. Father, I pray today that we would see testimony, evidence of that victory within our church body. Would you, by your grace, today save? The individual here today that may have been part of our church for years but doesn't truly know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray today you'd save. The individual today whose heart is, is angry at you, I pray today you would transform. I pray out of the little group of, of the children we have running out to class in a few minutes, the gospel will be power of God unto salvation. Would we see evidence today that you, that your son is the victorious Savior, Jesus Christ? Father, I thank you how we see evidence of that in Ken and in Jan's life right now. That Ken can face what he faces today and Jan witnesses it and can do it with a peace because of the victory of Jesus Christ upon the cross. They hold on to faith, Father, today that because of Christ's victory over death that there's eternity with you. Father, today I pray that we would see evidence of Jesus Christ's victory today in individuals who come in today defeated, ready to give up, that they would be strengthened. I pray today we would see evidences of your victory today for Caleb and Echo Stein ministering the gospel in, in Peru. That as they continue to pour out God's word, that they would, they would be encouraged by seeing your word advance. That they'd be encouraged as they shepherd their own children and seeing the gospel flourish within their lives. Father, I pray for different members within our church body, Marlene Nowak, the Schwarzendrubers, the Tishers. Father, as they face different physical struggles, failings of bodies. Would they take amazing comfort in their victorious Savior, Jesus Christ? Father, today I pray that you would work. You'd work among your people today. You would do it through your word today. And you would do it for your glory today. In Jesus' name we pray these things. We can do it confidently because that Savior we just prayed to is the victorious King. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with us again as we sing of the great grace of our God through the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. We'll go right into the song, Come Thou Fount After God of Grace. Lift your voices together, God of Grace. <laughs> Just reach. 
Right. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 this morning. A couple of housekeeping things for us. 
just to explain what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing this morning with the passage. So we've made it all the way to chapter 4 now over this, well, well, over this whole year by taking about two to maybe three verses a week. This week we're going to do ten. Okay? So you guys, ooh. Okay, before you pull your phone out and try to order some food for lunch, okay, because like, we're going to be here for a while, there's a reason for doing ten today. Um, it is one thought. Um, picked up all the way from the beginning of this chapter. It is one continuous thought that's been driving right now Paul within this, this concept of the unity of the church. And, and, and next week, uh, my plan is not to be here. My plan is to be on vacation, actually, for the next week and a half. So I didn't want to say, hey, we got through almost all of it, but pause. We'll pick it up in a few weeks because I know how your memories go. I get up here in a few weeks and be like, okay, Ephesians 4. And you're like, oh, yeah, we're in Ephesians, aren't we? What are we talking about? So I want to make sure we get done with the thought today. The other reason we're going to cover 10 is because in October, I actually preached two sermons from this passage. In fact, one of the sermons I preached from this passage was easily one of the, the five hardest sermons I've preached since I've been here. And so I hope that after reading this one today, you'll be like, oh yeah, I do remember something about that. You might even be able to go back online and listen to it again. So we, we've been in this passage for, for a few weeks recently. So we're not going to deal with some of the phrases as in depth because we just did that very recently in depth. So, Ephesians 4, verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us. According to the measure of Christ's gift, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This summer, my three oldest kids have been working through a series of books called The Mysterious Benedict Society. Anybody else jumping in on that? Mary Carlton, you're on your own on that one, I think. <laughs> The Mysterious Benedict Society tells the story of four children that come together, are joined together, to defeat this mysterious threat to the world. And each one of the kids has a unique ability. So like one of the kids can remember everything he reads, which would be an amazing gift. Uh, one of the kids is, um, can read people's minds and is also rather stubborn, which actually is not a unique ability, that's just called sin, okay? And we kind of all have that to different levels. Well, one of the kids of the four, uh, their ability is that they are resourceful and that they can, they can measure the distance in any room, which sounds really kind of foolish. Unless you're into construction or interior decorating, I'm not sure how that one really benefits you at all. But the beauty of the story is that when all four kids come together with their unique abilities of reading people's minds or remembering what they read, of measuring the rooms, all their unique abilities come together in such a way that, well, maybe they can defeat the mysterious foe. I don't know if all my kids have written and finished the end of the book, so I can't see how it ends. But this, this concept of individuals with different abilities coming together to work together to save the world, to defeat the foe, to win the game, is nothing new in storytelling. I have watched dozens upon dozens of Paw Patrol episodes 
that have told me that one super puppy is not enough to defeat the enemy. You need all the super puppies working together. I have watched enough Avengers movies to know that even though Captain America is the greatest superhero of all times, no debate, he still needs the help of Thor at times, or Hulk, or some other, other superhero, no matter what the alien invasion comes into. Because we've been taught that we are stronger with all of our unique abilities coming together to work together. I might have lost you because you don't know what Paw Patrol is, and you think Captain America is something about Fourth of July or something like that. But we know this in the real world. A team of all Aaron Rodgers would lose every game. And it'd be really fun to watch. <laughs> a company of CEOs wouldn't get anything done. We know that the best teams, the best companies, the best groups, are the ones in which different abilities of that team come together and complement each other so that work can get done. Growth can happen. Victory can be had. We know the truth. You see it play out in your jobs. We read stories about it. So then why do we struggle seeing that truth play out in the church? The first six verses of chapter 4 in Ephesians talk about walking worthy of the calling with which we've been called to. But walk worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ to save you, to adopt you. And how that, that passage begins to unfold is, and here's what a worthy walk is. It, is. it is walking humbly unified as a body of believers. Because this calling that you've been called to has produced a unity of the Spirit with, among you. You have the same faith, you have the same family, you have the same future, you have the same fellowship, is what verses 4, 5, and 6 says. So walk worthy by humbly maintaining this unity that the Spirit's worked in your lives. Now, verse 7 picks up and says, well, let's see how we can actually maintain that unity. And here's the beauty of 7, all the way down to 16. We maintain the unity and actually advance the church and grow the cause of Christ not by being uniform, but by faithfully using the blessings of God's spiritual gifts, abilities that he pours upon every single Christian. Like a team of superheroes, if you want to go there. With each one having their special ability, all are needed together to have victory. Very simply this morning, your spiritual gift is needed for growth. Your spiritual gift, Christian, is needed for growth within the body. Now, in order to make that statement, I need to first establish that you actually have a spiritual gift. And that's where Paul starts in verse number 7. There is a gift. Christ has given grace to every individual. But grace has been given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Now when I say grace, where does your mind automatically 90% of the time go to when I say grace, Christians? I got two whispers, mouth that I can read lips that I know we're on the same page. Where's it go to? Salvation. I mean, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works that no one can boast. So when we read, but grace was given to each of us, our minds go to, amen, salvation, Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. And I'm glad it goes there. Because grace is your only hope for a relationship with God. Some will disagree with me on that. Some will think that as long as they are fairly good, which simply just 
typically means that they can find a few people that are worse than them. <laughs> Some will think that as long as they, maybe their good outweighs their bad in their eyes, that they'll be okay. So some would disagree with grace is your only hope to have a relationship with God. And their actions show it. Because by God's grace, they see the sinfulness within their own heart that is in every individual's heart because we've all sinned millions upon millions upon millions of times over again. But they see the millions upon millions of sin in their life and they attempt to somehow compensate for it. They'll give out small fortunes. They'll go on journeys to spiritual places. They'll try to heap up some good works on the side. But when I say grace is your only hope for relationship with God, it is built upon the truth that you are far more sinful than you could ever imagine. And God is far more holy than we can ever comprehend. And the gap between my sin and a holy God is far more than a little bit of extra credit at the end of the semester can make up. My only hope is grace. And yet the good news is that God is more gracious than we could ever believe. So that he would send his son to make the perfect payment for sin. And that payment for sin would die upon the cross in the form of Jesus Christ. And not just die, but raise victorious over sin and death. Do you know that grace of God? Have you by faith in Jesus' death upon the cross run to that God to repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ's payment for sin alone? You can do that now. You can have that conversation with God right now. In verse 7, though, when it says, but grace was given to each one of us, he is referring to a group of Christians. And it is referring to the grace of God to give, to equip every single individual Christian with unique ability, giftedness to serve God and others. See, every blessing that God pours out upon us is grace. Can we agree with that one? And he's poured out a lot of blessings for us. Ephesians 1.3, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So, So everything that God gives to us by definition is grace because we do not deserve it. And so the fact that God would equip you and me to serve the God that we used to rebel against, that we hated, to somehow be a conduit of God's working in other individuals' life for his glory is an amazing grace of God. Every Christian has been uniquely gifted to serve the church, God, whether through teaching, administration, caring, giving, encouragement, helping, gifting with insight, discernment, wisdom, every one of us has been gifted uniquely with a unique level of gifting. That's where it goes in verse number seven. Go back to it. Grace is given to each one of us based on what? Based on the measure of Christ's gift. So so based upon Christ, these gifts, based upon Christ's wisdom, based upon Christ's sovereign plan, these gifts are poured out uniquely to individuals with unique levels, with unique insight, with unique abilities that God in his perfect formula puts together to do his work. Jesus illustrates this in the parable of the talents. Not everyone receives the same amount. And they're not judged based upon what they do in comparison to the other person. They're judged on faithfulness with the amount that they're given. Line up 100 people who have the gift of teaching. And they will not teach to the same ability to the same group of people at the same times. 
every individual, every Christian, you have been uniquely mapped out by God's grace. One individual I read called this, we're, we're all different snowflakes, which I didn't want to get up here and call you all a bunch of snowflakes. So, But you get the picture. We are all uniquely graced by God to serve him. Now, Paul has made an assertion. He's made a statement. God gives grace in the form of spiritual gifts to every Christian, period. Verse number seven. He's made this statement. But I know how many Christians think. And you're really not convinced of the statement. I think many Christians hear a passage like that and because of how they view themselves or view others don't think there's any way that they really can serve. Speak to somebody else about spiritual things? You've got to be kidding me. And so Paul backs up the claim that Jesus Christ has the power to give gifts by showing who this Jesus Christ is. See, see, I mean, in order for us to take confidence on the promise that he's given gifts means that we need to know who the individual giving the gift is. So I had a birthday this past week. If my youngest promised to buy me season tickets to the Michigan Wolverines and, and, Flights on a private jet each Saturday to get me to the games. Should I get excited about opening my gifts up on my birthday? Not in the least, because he has zero ability to do that. In fact, he did not even give me a package of real peanut M&Ms this year. He gave me a picture of peanut M&Ms that he colored. They have less calories, so and there's a plus on that one. But that's where his ability lies. So if verse number seven says, hey, Christians, everyone in the church at Ephesus, you have been gifted graciously by God, by Jesus Christ's gifts to serve him. Well, the only ability for that to encourage me is if the one who gives the gifts has the ability to actually pour out these gifts. You track with my logic? Does he have the ability? Verse eight. Therefore, it says... When he ascended on high, he led away a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Christian, have confidence. You have spiritual gifts because Christ is the victorious king. See, Paul's, Paul's mind, he just knows scripture and by the Holy Spirit brings things into his mind through inspiration where he connects dots and he knows Psalm 68. God ascended, he's victorious. He, he carries out captives with him with his victory. And Paul's mind connects dots and says, hey, Jesus Christ ascended. I mean, of course, he had to des descend first because he's in heaven. So he descends down to earth, born as a, as a baby, lives a perfect life, dies for sin, and then ascends as the victorious king back to heaven. That's what verses 9 and 10 just reference. And Jesus Christ has captives. Does Jesus Christ take captives with his death? He does. He defeats the foe of Satan. He crushes Satan's head. He's victorious over sin's penalty death as he, as he rises from the grave. He takes captives with him. Now where Paul goes in his thinking though is as look, here's Jesus Christ. He's ascended. He's victorious. He has captives. So here is Jesus Christ seated upon throne in the heights of heaven, pouring out gifts. He can do it. He's the victorious king. Please don't look down at who you are or maybe who you don't think you are. And bemoan the fact about who you are. I know we have sin. We bemoan that. We grieve over that. 
but who in God's sovereignty he has created you to be and formed you. And then at salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit gifts you to be and to serve. It's an amazing blessing from God. Now there's one small thing about this verse that I just need to point out, so take a time out. Because if I don't, some of you are going to send emails to me this week and you're going to get an email back automatically that says, I am out of the office right now. So I'll get back to you in a few days. So I'm just going to be preemptive on this one. If you read verse 18 in Psalm 60, it says that God gets to his throne and then receives a whole bunch of gifts. Like I defeated all these foes and now they're subservient to me, so they've got to pour out gifts to me. Paul quotes and he even says it. Therefore it says... And so he's quoting this verse, and he gets to the end, and he just flips it and says, and Jesus gives gifts now. So does Paul just get to randomly change phrases in Scripture to fit his argument? Whew, okay, I got one head shake and one no verbally. Does Paul just get to randomly change phrases in Scripture to fit his argument? Okay, we're going to do, do a doctrine class again on inspiration or something like that, okay? No, he does not. So, what's going on? I think a couple of things could be happening here. The Aramaic translation, so different language, actually has the exact same phrasing that Paul uses right there. And it was, it was present when Paul's writing this. And so I think there's some aspect there where Paul could say, I'm, just, I'm quoting from this Bible over here, this translation. But even that translation, I think, can still be on par here. Because there's this concept of... of of, of, of giving a gift. See, most kings, when they receive gifts, what do they do with their gifts? Build a bigger treasury in the back of their castle, right? And then raise taxes the next day because they need more. Go out and defeat another foe because they need more. Is that the kind of God my God is? Not in the least. Does my God need more gifts? Whoever, whoever, whoever has given to God that he should be repaid by God. I think what Paul's doing is completing the thought of who my God is, and he's using a, a concept that is used a couple times in the Old Testament of where we, we receive in order to give. And in Paul's mind, he says, wait a minute here. So he's, he's conquered, he's defeated, he receives, but he doesn't need it. And so he uses what he's received to bless those who follow him and gift them. So, you, Christian, have a gift. A spiritually equipping in order to serve God and others for God's glory. Whether you say amen to that or not, I say amen to that. Don't believe it? Don't doubt Jesus Christ has the ability to do it. But I think there is still doubt that we push upon this because I think some of us get to this passage and say, fine, I have a gift, but I don't know what to do with this gift. Fine, I have a gift, but there is no way I could actually do something like that. You're telling me I should talk to somebody else? Can we text? Can we, can, can, does that count as a gift? I'm supposed to care for somebody else? Love somebody else? Speak the gospel to somebody else? Give them, give them advice and wisdom through God's word? I don't think so. And yet as the passage continues, it says not only do you have a gift, Jesus Christ has the power to do it, but you have been equipped to use your gift. Have confidence you can use your spiritual gift because pastors have been given to equip you for the service of your gift. See, verse number 11 and 12, he zeroes in on a, on a few different gifts that have been given to the church. And there's actually some play here because one, they have received gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, but they are also, in the phrasing, they are gifts to the church to serve the church. You need training to use your spiritual gift. I've watched enough superhero movies to know that just because you get bitten by a spider does not mean that all of a sudden you have the abilities or to use your gifts to the maximum ability. 
Sometime in the movie, there needs to be a, a song, and they practice shooting their webs, or they practice flying over and over again. And within usually about three days, they've mastered their gifts, and now they're superheroes. You need equipping to use the gift. And the passage, what he says is there's shepherds and there's teachers that God has given to do just that. Two, verse number 12, equip the saints to go about the work of ministry so that the body of Christ is built up. Pastors equip. The church engages in ministry. The church expands. Does that sound familiar to anybody of you? Okay, some of you need to go back and listen to a sermon half from October because we said that about 27 times in a half hour. Sometimes we don't see this happen. We don't see this happen because we view the role of the pastor as someone who performs spiritual services for us. We view church as something that we come to, give offering to, and then expect a certain amount of religious services given back to us because we put what we put in. First Baptist Church, this is not the first time I'm going to tell you this. That is not how the church is supposed to function. Each one of you have been given a gift to serve him and others with. So use it. Not sure you have a gift? Be confident you do. Jesus Christ is the victorious king. Not sure you can use it? Jesus has given you shepherds to equip you to use that gift. See, the problem is sometimes, and I'll be honest, the problem is sometimes pastors fail to equip. But I also think the problem is that many times individuals have been equipped for years upon years upon years, but never move past being equipped into actually using what they've been equipped to have. They never get past the training video stage of Christianity. They never get past the taking in, taking in, taking in, and they never get bridged that fact of, I am scared to actually now go give and to serve and to love and to speak truth. When I disciple somebody and we sit down and talk through Scripture, my hope is that someday that individual will do exactly what I'm doing for them to somebody else. How many of you were to, how many of you, some Christian came alongside you and just, I don't know how to phrase it, did some life with you, read scripture with you, read a book with you, encouraged you, explained some passages of scripture with you. How many of you, somebody did that for you? You're not meant to be a dead end for that. You are meant to repeat that. When when I counsel somebody and life is broken, they're they're falling apart in different areas or they can't get victory here, and we, we wade through some heavy stuff. Yes, my burden is that they can have victory, that that relationship can be restored, but my burden is also that they are equipped to speak those same truths to other individuals in years to come. When I pray on a Sunday morning, yes, I am praying. But in how I pray and what I pray for, I am also hoping to equip you in how to pray. When when I teach, yes, I hope truths connect to your life and they move to application in your life, but I'm also training you in how to use God's word and be faithful to God's word as you study God's word on your own and then speak God's word to other individuals. Some of you have been equipped for decades for something you have never taken a step into doing. Like the athlete who's continually in preseason mode and never plays a game. The sad reality is that we exist, church, at a time where we as a church are far more equipped than any other age in all of Christianity. Because we have more Bible knowledge than any other age. We have more resources at our fingertips than any other age. You have heard more sermons preached than any other age. 
you are far more equipped than any other age. And far too often, we don't do anything with it. We have been given a unique spiritual gift by Christ. You have. What you have as gifting, what levels you have of gifting is different than the person sitting next to you. So what do we do with it? This won't be a shocker. Use it. Use it. Your spiritual gift is needed for growth. Christ has given gifts to equip the church for growth. Verse 16. For whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You do the work on this. Look back down to verse 16. I'll ask the question. You look at verse 16. What has to happen for the body, for the church, to grow, to be built up in love, the love of Christ? What has to happen for the growth to happen? Each part is working properly. That's what has to happen. The teaching part faithfully and clearly proclaiming the truth, not just one person up at a pulpit saying this is what God's word says, but all those with teaching giftedness within the body, whether in groups at set times, unplanned conversations around the church building after a service that offer wisdom and instruction and unpack God's word. One-on-one -on -one individuals sitting down over a cup of coffee saying, here's how God's word is working in my life. Let me share it with you. All those individuals able to teach God's word in small group, taking questions and applications of God's word in their life, having opportunities to teach God's word, each part working properly. Those individuals caring and mercy gifts being used to care and to show God's love, to weep with those who are weeping and rejoice with those who are rejoicing and being aware of where there is brokenness and their hurt within the body and then striving to meet those needs through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the resources he's blessed you with, with each part working properly. The giving of gifts, pouring out blessings to meet needs and providing for the ministry to happen, the encouragement gifts to be given abundantly each part of the body working properly, leadership mobilizing, administration connecting dots of resources to needs to individuals, each part working properly. Church, your spiritual gift is needed for growth, period. By our lack of engagement for that growth, we either have to conclude that maybe we selfishly don't care about the growth of other individuals next to us. Maybe that we're not concerned about anybody beyond ourselves. To think that you have been gifted by the grace of God, a unique piece of the puzzle to serve others. And say, I don't care. Your spiritual gift is needed for growth. The passage even tells us how to use that gift. Verse 15, rather speaking, the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, the Christ. How do we grow? We speak the truth in love. I really take verse 15 to explain how we go about working properly. It's how we actually use our gifts. We speak the truth in love. 
We, we don't get to take the gifts of encouragement, of teaching, of wisdom, and discernment, and then use them how we want to use them. We use them with both truth and love. We can't just have truth and forget the love. We can't have the individuals who think that they have the gift of discernment and wisdom and the heresy alarms go off, whether correctly or not, and they come, guns loaded, with truth claims to shoot down whatever they see. And it doesn't matter who they run over and what immature Christian gets given an earful and what faithful Christian gets written off because they don't cross the T's doctrinally just as you do. Truth in love. They go together. But the error goes on the other side exactly the same. Don't use your gifts with just love and no truth. My gifts of encouragement and, and mercy and care and help cannot simply be, let me meet your needs as I ignore the lie that is your life and where I need to speak truth into your life. They go together. Truth and love. Colossians 4, let your speech always, and I love that word, always, be gracious, seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Truth and love. Your spiritual gift is needed for growth. And your spiritual gift is needed to be used properly through the truth of God's word and the love of Jesus Christ. So that we can have growth. What's that growth? Verse 13. So I'm, I'm jumping around here. I know 16, 14, 13. I know how to count, okay? It's just the order we're taking it in logically. What's that growth? Until all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's the growth we look for? Unity of the faith of a body of believers that is Christ-like. That's growth. And don't categorize this under those would be nice if it happens, but it's not a big deal. This is desperately needed to happen. Because the alternative is verse number 14. So that you are no longer children, immature in your faith, tossed to and fro by every wave and carried about by every wind of doctrine and deceitful schemes. Don't use your gifts don't have the church grow into maturity. Don't grow in unity of faith. Then we are leaving ourselves and you are abandoning others to spiritual infancy in the faith or maybe even shipwreck because you are failing to be the means of God's grace to speak truth in love to others. When I say your spiritual gift is needed for growth, it means that when the spiritual gifts are not exercised, we are leaving ourselves as a body of believers, as a church as a whole, or individuals within our body with no grounding so that we are tossed about and forth by the waves of the culture around us. The next news event crushes us. The next big story distracts us. The next cool teaching in religious circles pulls us away. The next indoctrination attempt by the world confuses us. Church, please understand what this passage says. There is danger here. Every wind of doctrine, the next thing that comes up. The craftiness and deceitful schemes. Human cunning. There's danger. We need growth. I don't know what... And when Paul says these things, I don't know what he's picturing. I don't know when he says deceitful schemes, what deceitful schemes were going through the church at Ephesus. Not, I'm not 100% sure. But does deceitful schemes, every wind of doctrine, and the craftiness of deceitful and human cunning, can that be applied to the 21st century American church? Every other year, LifeWay Research, which is the SBC 
arm of this research, and Ligonier Ministries, so it's a Presbyterian Southern Baptist Partnership, does a survey of the state of evangelicalism within America. Now, do we understand the term evangelicalism, hopefully? There's just those who hold to the gospel faith. And they do this survey every other year. They pull all of population, and then they pull those who would hold to the gospel. And they don't just ask the question, do you believe in the gospel? They actually ask a series of questions to say, okay, they actually believe the gospel, they are evangelical. So the last results, 2022 hasn't come out yet, so this is two years old. The way the last two years go, I'm assuming these numbers are worse. Deceitful schemes, human craftiness, wavery wind of doctrine. When asked about to evangelicals, those who believe the gospel, does modern science disprove the Bible? 17% of evangelicals would say yes two years ago. 44% of evangelicals would agree with the statement, everyone, is, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. That means 44% of those who say they believe the gospel would disagree with what statement that I made earlier in the sermon about millions upon millions upon millions of our sins that we are worse than we could ever imagine. 42% agrees with God accepts worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. That's evangelical, not, not your next-door neighbor. That's people who are gathering in churches like this this morning. 22% agree that gender identity is a matter of choice. Evangelical. 19% believes that Bible's condemnation of homosexuality doesn't apply today. That's evangelical's response. Your spiritual gift is needed for growth. There is real danger. And the church needs to be strengthened. Add in the struggles with sin, idolatry, and disinterest. Add in relational messes and the strain of marriages, the fracturing of families, the disillusion, the distracted Christian. Add in addictions. Add in infant Christians in need of growth and encouragement. Add in the hurting and the dis disappearing and depressed. That add in those individuals with physical needs. There is need. Your spiritual gift is needed for growth. What does this look like? What does it look like, church? In some ways, I can say the easy way it looks like is the next time there's an announcement saying, church, we have a need. God blesses us each Sunday with 20, 30 children in need of gospel truth in their life. And our indifference to that To concern us. What does it look like? It looks to be far more concerned about the individual next to you and where they're at in their spiritual walk with God and what they need today than whether you can get to your car in the next 30 seconds after we say amen. There is need. And you by your testimony of the gospel in your life, have been gifted uniquely to meet the need. And you've been equipped to meet the need. Your spiritual gift is needed for growth. So use your gift. Able to encourage somebody? Find the person you can encourage. Use your gift. Talk to enough people today, and you'll find out somebody's struggling. Use your gift. Talk to enough people today, and you're going to find some people who are in need in prayer today. Use your gift. Talk to enough people, invest in enough individuals' lives, and you're going to find individuals questioning things that the Bible is very clear upon. Use your gift. Because your spiritual gift is needed for growth.
And by God's grace, you have it. So very simply, use it. Let's pray. Father God, we use the word grace at the beginning. And we are in need of your grace. It is your grace that gives us the ability to have a relationship with you. It is your grace that continues to bless us. It is your grace, Father, that pours out gifts upon us. It is your grace that you would even use us as a conduit of your working. We thank you for grace. And now, Father, we pray that you would take your word, the encouragement the passage offers, the warning the passage offers, the correction the passage offers, and that you would use your spirit within your church to do a work for your glory. That this body of believers would come together and work properly each part so that we could grow up in love. Not us individually thinking that we're okay, we're fine, we can move on. But a gospel that so transforms us, Father, that we, we see others in need and see how you've equipped us, how we've been invested into for years and how we can speak to it. Meet it. Disciple it. Love. Would we be a church, Father, that is working properly and so it is, grow, it is built up in the love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Would you stand? We respond in song. Vocalists can come up and help us with that. We say amen. We take God's word and we contemplate God's word in our life now. Of how we actually apply this. I'll tell you right now, this is the easy point. You can actually see people around you. This week will be a little bit harder. They're going to be farther away. Your gift is needed for growth. We can be engaged. In your hymnals, hymn number 40, Let the Earth Resound.
As we close this morning, the song, Across the Lands, you are the word of God the Father. Lift your voices together, Across the Lands. reminders for you that are in your worship folder this morning. You don't need to be seated. You can remain standing. It's okay. You don't need to be seated. I, I said that too quickly. All right. We have a baseball fellowship coming up here on August the 7th. If you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. There is an $11 charge for the tickets, a very minimal charge, but, but we'd like to get a good group of us together uh, for fellowship there uh, for the Chinooks game on August 7th. And then um, there is a number, there's a huge stack of door hangers in the office, and we're inviting and encouraging you uh, to utilize the gifting that God has given you to, uh, to be spreading the gospel and to share what's happening at First Baptist Church. If you're interested in doing that, I'd encourage you to talk to, to Kevin, and Kevin is going to have maps for those and give direction for you on that. And so we'd encourage you uh, in that way to be used uh, by God there. This afternoon, we are doing our Summer in the Psalms at Quaz Creek Park. If you don't know where that is, pop it into your Google Maps. It's just a little bit east of the high school, and uh, you can turn a few streets back there. It's a beautiful park. Some of us are jumping in the water on, on canoes and kayaks and inner tubes at about 3.30. We're going to meet at 3.30 at Auxiliary Court. If you don't know where Auxiliary Court is, come and see me. If you have questions about the float, come and see me. And I can give you directions. We're going to meet there at 3.30. We're going to get in the, in the, in the river by 4 o'clock and then meet everyone down at Quas Creek. We're going to get out of Quas Creek and we're going to rendezvous there uh, for our summer in the Psalms tonight at 6 o'clock. If you're just coming, well, if you're coming at all to Summer in the 
the Psalms tonight at Quas Creek. I'd encourage you, bring a lawn chair. Uh, there are a few picnic tables around, but if you could bring a lawn chair, that will be helpful for us. And then bring some bug spray, all right? Because we don't know what the bugs will be like. may not be bad, but it might be. It might be. Uh, and so we want you to be ready for that. So looking forward to that time tonight. So 6 o'clock if you're meeting us at the park, 3.30 for those who are going down the river, meet us at Auxiliary Court. See me about questions on that. This morning, after we get done here, spend a few moments of fellowship, and then we're going to be back in here, adults, at 1045. Sunday school teachers, we will need you to, to do your classes at 1045. Members meeting, though, at 1045 for the adults in here. And, uh, and a few important things to go over. Following the members meeting, we will still have our ABF time uh, following that. So plan to be a part of that. Uh, maybe you're not a member. We still encourage you. You're welcome to come to the meeting. But, uh, but, but don't take off. Join us for ABFs following that. We're dismissed. We'll see you.